question. So greetings and good afternoon to all. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this webinar titled Using Technology to Break Down Student Barriers to Success with our special guest today, Timothy Marshall, Chief Innovation Officer from Indian River State College and moderated by Carlos Morales, his chair and president of Tarrant County College Connect Campus. Uh, let me stop for a while the presentation here so we can uh, properly see each other. And today we are pleased to have more than 150 participants registered from more than 18 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico, including K-12 schools as well, from the pr private and public uh, system. We also, or also have more than 20 universities and colleges in the U.S. from states like New York, New Jersey, California, Louisiana, Texas, Massachusetts, and Florida. And today we have two special uh, uh, participants from international institutions, uh, one from Barbados Community College, and also we have one participant from the University of Tokyo. So I don't know if it's good night, good, good morning, good evening there, but welcome all. Finally, we also have participation from organizations and partner collaborators uh, like Aspira, COSEI, Servicio Canario de Salud in Spain also, and we also have from the Internet Society chapter in Puerto Rico. So greeting to all, we hope that this webinar will be of a great benefit to uh, support uh, uh, more, our more than 40 member institutions in Puerto Rico, Latin America, and the and United States, and other institutions who participate and are invited to participate as well from this webinar. Before we begin, as you may see at the beginning from this semester, for this semester, we made a welcome presentation with announcements and promotions so we can dedicate more time to our special guests. But I just want to emphasize uh, two things. First of all, at the end of this webinar, you will be receiving an email with the link to the electronic survey so you can help us evaluate this webinar and also help us identify with head services and initiatives can support the faculty, administrators, and also your students and how you, uh, your recommendations on how we can promote these services uh, better or in a better or more effective way. The survey is anonymous. And the estimate time to complete it is just five minutes. So please help us complete that. Your input and feedback are very valuable to us. And finally, we would like to encourage you to invite and share our invitations to our webinars to others, to your uh, colleagues and friends. So not only you, but others can benefit from this, uh, register and benefit from these webinars. And, and, and let me remind you that our next webinar for faculty and administrators will be tomorrow. And the title is Valide Validación de Identidad, Calidad y Cumplimiento, con la doctora Mayra Caraballo. That's going to be at 3 p.m. Hora de Puerto Rico, the next one uh, in the schedule is, uh, Stephanie, you pass the, the slide, is uh, what's going to be uh, the next uh, Friday, eh, Mayo 7, eh, yeah, and the topic is, ¿Qué podemos lograr cuando ayudamos a la facultad en los cursos en línea y qué provoca en nuestros estudiantes? With Dr. Berenice Rodríguez from la Universidad de Puerto Rico en Aguadilla. The next one we have. A schedule for this semester is with Dr. Lisbel M. Correa from Inter-American University, and the topic is Enseñanza Modalidad No Tradicionales, Tendencias y Desafíos, y este va a ser on Friday, May 14, and the other one is with Dr. Marta Mena, uh, she's from uh, uh, Chile, and uh, the webinar will be Gestionar la Virtualidad, El Tránsito de la Presencialidad, a la virtualidad. That's going to be on May 28. 
And we also have webinars, the next one, bueno, we have one in, in June, that's the last one for this semester, with Dr. Carmen Burgos Videla, and that's going to be, eh, she's from the Universidad de Alcala in Chile, también, excuse me, Marta Mena is from Argentina, I confuse both, Marta Mena from Argentina, Carmen Burgos from Chile, and the webinar will be Paradojas Acerca de la Producción de Conocimiento Científico en Junio 4. Y también tenemos dos webinars para estudiantes que le pedimos Please help us promote it among your students. Tomorrow we have one at 1 p.m. How does Peterson Test Prep and Career Prep can take your goals to the next level? That's going to be for students tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And the last one from students this semester is going to be in Spanish. And it's going to be with Dr. Joe Diaz. And the topic is Revisando Mi Proyecto de Vida, Ser, Hacer y Tener. Así que that's the, the, the rest of the webinars for this semester. We, help, we have some, several of them, so you still have time to continue learning from these experts that are invited to share with us. And now we are ready to start our webinar, and I am pleased to present Dr. Carlos Morales, head chair, who will moderate the webinar and also present our special guest uh, speaker today. Excuse me, Carlos. Thank you, Jubelkis. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my uh, pleasure to present our speakers for today's webinar, uh, Mr. Timothy Marshall. He is Chief Information Officer at Indian River State College. Uh, Timothy has over 25 years of experience in technology and executive management in multiple industries like defense and electronics manufacturing, banking, higher education, and K-12 districts. He has performed technology and operational assessments as, at over 100 colleges and universities in areas of online and distance education, technology infrastructure, applications, uh, implementation of applications, I'm sorry, and hosting, among other important uh, assessment uh, aspects. He has presented findings to wider audiences, uh, larger than uh, 400 colleges and universities. He is a lifelong learner with numerous certificates in different areas, and he has a bachelor's degree in science in computer systems and a master's degree of science in management systems. He is all but dissertation for EDD in organizational and community leadership. I want to take a moment of privilege and, and number one, thanks uh, Tim uh, for being available this afternoon. Uh, one element that we didn't mention in the bio is that Tim and I used to work at Tarrant. Uh, he, he just left Texas for, for more humid weather, but that's fine. We will not blame him, okay? But he, he was um, instrumental in uh, providing the support for the creation of TCC Connect Campus, which is the campus that I lead. Uh, he provided lots of leadership in terms of technology and, and strategies as we were building this campus. So again, thank you, Tim, for, for all that help and for being here this afternoon. So you can take it away. Thank you, Carlos, for that, that introduction. You know, it's, it's intimidating sometimes when you see your body of work up on a screen. Um, I don't think I've done 25 years of doing anything, and now I have to realize that, I, that I'm, that I'm, old, that I'm older than I think I am. So, um, uh, you know, that, that what brought me to community colleges was I was a community college student, and I was, uh, you know, uh, what, what would be considered at the poverty level at the time. And um, after my consulting uh, career was coming uh, to an end because I just got tired of flying all over the world, um, I, I wanted to make sure I, I found myself at the kinds of institutions that were that made a difference in my life. And I want to, you know, basically my my vision matches very well with a lot of uh, our organizational visions of using you know technology to break down barriers to student uh, to student success. And um, you know, I, when I finally found my way back to the classroom, I realized, um, you know, that that was the place for me. And I, I blossomed and I watched fellow students blossom. But, you know, I didn't really get back to the classroom until I was 27 years old, an adult student that had to be pushed and prodded into the classroom. And at every opportunity that there was a barrier, whether it was financial or time management, um, I found myself dropping out. So, um, you know, so my right now my my goal is to make sure that there's fewer people like me left around and by um you know working in areas where 
Um, you, we may not be, I might not be uh, directly connected to instruction. Um, I will try to get our students into instruction as soon as possible. So I'll, uh, let, let's talk about, you know, you know that history of, of that goal. And then I'm finding that that, that goal is, is a reason for a lot of um, changes in student systems over, over the um, past couple of years. So, um, you know, whenever I get a project presented to me um, by faculty, by staff, by an organization that might be um, in like a school district or a, a legislator, you know, my first question is always, why are we doing what, what is being asked to be done? And, um, you know, the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, you know, when I get to the slide. Um, and then uh, I'll, we'll talk about how you take a practiced approach to, you know, providing resources to, cer to certain activities that can, you know, break down these barriers for our students. And um, again, starting from research, and then I'll talk about some very specific projects that I engaged in over the last seven to 10 years with regards to transportation, food security, um, health services, access to specific programs, and then access to materials. Because um, as you'll see, um, these items are um, straight from our students' mouths with regards to the barriers that um, they find it difficult to uh, to attend classes. And, um, and you know, the majority of these were also barriers prior to COVID. And they have been, um, in some cases, elevated because of COVID to a higher level of criticality and, um, and, you know, we can talk about that. And I'm looking forward to the question and answer uh, period when I can ask some questions of, of you from your different organizations to, to see if, you're, um, if your experience is the same or different than mine. So, um, you know, prior, I think this, this effort started mostly uh, around 2014 and 15 in Dallas. And um, th the questions were, uh, really focused on over the, the past decade prior to 2014 and 15, uh, Dallas Community College District, now called Dallas College, um, one of the largest community colleges in the country, um, 80,000 credit students, 25,000 non-credit students a year, was suffering declining retention. Um, and that was fall to spring and fall to fall retention. And in fact, fall to fall retention still hovers around 50%. So, you know, half the students, you know, 40,000 students are leaving um, from one fall to the next. And um, it became an issue when um, for, for some of the people outside of the traditional student services offices, because this was occurring in an area or at a time when we were increasing enrollments and increasing headcount. Um, so they, the retention issue wasn't that much of an issue until uh, the state of Texas challenged uh, the community college system to say we need 60% um, of our population uh, by 2030 to have uh, a post-secondary credential. And, and we realized at that time that a lot of our students that were coming into the system were leaving. Also, uh, with regards to um, another performance metric that we measured, um, or another metric that we measured was actually performance in classes. So not only did we see students, you know, um, not retaining from one semester to the next, but also within the semester, they were starting to fail at a, at a higher rate. And um, as they hit 2014 and 15, the, that, 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 that decade of incre increasing enrollments started to plateau. So, um, you know, that, that then became, okay, why are we focusing on um, issues outside the classroom and how can we approach what seemed to us to be 15 or 20 different variables that, you know, we were always trying to um, uh, put resources towards, whether it was orientation, whether it was tutoring, whether it was um, different types of student services with regards to how you do cohorts. Um, we didn't have a, a good practice method of establishing a baseline and then measuring ourselves against those baseline using all the, all the research, uh, muscles that we gained during our, our, our own educational journey. So what we um, decided to do was conduct uh, surveys, you know, the, the surveys, the type of surveys that you would conduct, and in many cases, quantitatively, um, that institutional research 
typically conducts for you. Um, we just decided to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the, the, um, the data that we were looking at and seeing how our data matched the data from the, the local council of governments in Texas, the Dal Dallas County, Dallas City. Um, do, did our demographic breakdown match the demographic breakdown of the, of the, of the local um, area and the citizenship? Did our student population um, represent you know, one to one the population we had with regards to um, economic strata. And um, we, we started to so, um, baseline select the criteria. And to our board of trustees, when this information was presented, it was really eye opening. Um, they were not aware of the, the poverty um, pandemic that was already in Dallas at that time, where, um, you know, a good 40 to 50 percent of the uh, the population was considered at or below the poverty level, and uh, a good portion of that group was significantly below the poverty level. And we were saying, well, these are our students. How? And, and we saw the same reflection. In, in, in fact, our students were at a higher rate of poverty than the, the local citizenry. Um, so that, that again begged the question of what do we, then the, okay, so now we know that our, that our citizens are poor and our, our students are poor. What, what does that mean? How does that um, affect the services that we're going to provide to them? So um, we quickly uh, created a quantitative and qualitative project that engaged our faculty and staff, and we asked for volunteers, and we thought we were going to get 20 or 30 volunteers, and we had 80 volunteers. And these volunteers, uh, which we pared down to 60, um, we took a core uh, representation of our students um, about 400 students and our faculty followed them through two semesters, interviewing them, um, diving deeper into the survey questions, and then allowing the students to tell their stories about what made them successful and also um, where we may have lost them. Because not only did we follow students through those two semesters that they were still enrolled, we also followed them if they dropped out. So um, the, the quantitative uh, um, amount of information was uh it was i as as a quantitative person that depends on numbers when i saw the qualitative information that was gathered i really i was stuck and so it was at this time i started you know diving back into my education going for that doctoral degree to find out what what, I, what we could get out of the data but what my my peers at the institution realized rather quickly using some some good qualitative um uh, decisioning tools and some, you know, the word cloud kind of stuff was there were some very significant barriers that a, a good majority of our, our students were um, experiencing in areas where we really did not give maybe more than lip service to with regards to our advising and our career coaches. And we knew that if we could just make any sort of movement in some of these areas, we would could we, we, we would hope to significantly decrease the retention numbers I mean, the, the high reten uh, disretention rate that we had, and then maybe even provide some su some services to our students. And we would, you know, and the charge from our chancellor was we got to do this without uh, any net new money, internal net new money. So that so uh, as I get to into the storytelling, you'll see that this was, you know, we, we started to depend highly on um, relationships of organizations outside of our uh, institution. So the, the, the most um, uh, noticed variable for our students uh, that, they, that they let us know over and over and over again was um, transportation. So I think it, the number was over 40% of our students said this was the primary reason why they had issues coming to our campus or campuses. And, and I'll get into that discussion, uh, you know, when... Uh, a little bit further, but of course, this population that we serve in a city in the, in the Dallas County, um, the, the poverty situation is so um, deep that many of our students just don't have transportation that they can call their own. And even if they did have a car, in many cases, it was a car that was not reliable enough that would allow them to visit our campuses and, and be a student in our classrooms on a regular basis. Another situation, and, and, and some of you might be um, in the same situation, is though we had uh, seven campuses around 
uh, Dallas and one uh, six around Dallas and one in the center of Dallas. They were all separately accredited. Um, they did not all have the same programs. And even though they were separately accredited, a student could easily move between them in a program manner. But um, we made it hard for them uh, with regards to uh, our historical program offerings where, let's say, nursing was only at one campus, and that might be downtown, and a student might have lived, might live, you know, 20, 30 minutes away. That's if they had a car, and maybe an hour away if they had public transportation. And so that, that, that increased the burden on them with regards to how much money they had to pay for public transportation to visit one campus that might be nearby and get their um, core courses. But then in, depending on the program that they were in, they would have to travel all around Dallas to finish out their um, program, the degree program. So we call these swirl students. Uh, we, we created a name for them because, you know, they're swirling around the city trying to uh, get their degree in ways that we would never have uh, anticipated. And um, the, those students that successfully swirled, that were able to, you know, figure this out on their own, were the most successful students we had. But they all, their cost of education was also the highest because of their, um, you know, they, they depended so much on uh, transportation that it was becoming a larger, larger cost of their of their attendance. So um, once we realized that these students, in some cases, they they had four times greater opportunities to, to to complete their degree and certificate program than those students that only visited one campus and then maybe dropped out. Um, if we could just get them a free DART pass, um, we would you know DART is the Dallas Area Rapid Transit and it's buses and um, uh, light rail. If we could get them a, a, a DART pass in their hands, you know the, the majority of this transportation issue would go away. So our, our foundation uh, worked with the DART and we negotiated a, a cost that actually has gone down over time that would allow for our students, if they were qualified and the qualifications were um, six credit hours at a minimum uh, for credit courses, 12 contact hours for non-credit courses. And um, if, you, if you satisfied that, we'd get you a DART pass and they could use that for any mode of uh, dark transportation at any time. Um, in, the, in the beginning, we, we started talking about just to the travel between our campuses, um, but the, 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 the differential, you know, for the cost between any campus and then any dark stop or any location um, was minimal. So we um, engaged in that. And the, so the college picked up the cost, but it was a cost that um, we went to our foundation for to pay. It didn't come out of our operating uh, funds. And uh, uh, initially, we used uh, student ID cards with stickers on it, and it, that became a really a mess when you started thinking about um, 40,000, 50,000, 80,000 students that we were anticipating taking advantage of this. Um, you know, that's a lot of uh, student ID cards that we were not using in in in, in the past. So. Um, Rather quickly, within a few months, we created a, a data sharing agreement with the DART um, agency. We helped them find an app um, that would uh, be installed on a student's phone, and that app would, uh, you know, we could, we could remotely uh, detonate the app if they didn't enroll, and um, you know, it, it worked really well. And now DART uses that GoPass app for the rest of their uh, um, constituents, and uh, this student. Uh, population um, that uses it, uses it religiously. So about 12 to 20,000 students a semester pre-COVID were signed up. It kind of, um, it went in, in, in fits and ways. And I think it's, it's related to the programs that we offer that not all semesters or all programs offered. So some of the, you know, you started realizing the different um, uh, uh, you know, demographics are being fed by your program as opposed to the program being fed by the demographics. Um, we were finding that we were imposing some uh, of these uh, travel uh, issues on top of our students just by the way we offered programs. And then on the back side, uh, the data sharing agreement allowed us at the college to start plumbing the data, not only of our student traffic patterns, but also how they compared to the traffic patterns of the citizenry of Dallas. And that gave us some pretty interesting 
um, visiting, uh, you know, we saw how our students just massively undertook um, when the, uh, you know, the use of DART when the Texas State Fair was in town. And, um, and then uh, a really odd situation popped up when certain faculty members in our biology and our horticultural uh, trades uh, and landscaping trades um, started telling their students that, hey, you know, even if you don't, uh, you know, need to come to school on, a, on, on the dark pass, you should to go to the Arboretum, which is in the city, in the middle of the city. It's not really, um, uh, you know, targeted to our student population. But um, the Arboretum will allow college students to come visit for free. And it's the second largest Arboretum, I think, in the nation, one of the top five in the, in the world. And um, our, our, we started seeing a significant growth of our students visiting the Arboretum for courses and then also when courses were not in, um, in place. So uh, these, uh, we ended up then using that information to start holding some classes at the Arboretum with regards to um, continuing education where, you know, the non-credit population can, you know, come and learn about, uh, you know, the, the flora and fauna of, of, of Texas at the Arboretum and, oh, by the way, get a free dart pass for your trouble. So a, a lot of interesting side uh, um, activities based on the, um, the action of the, our, you know, 12 to 20,000 students. And, um, for those students that use the DART Pass, we did see um, a, an increase in their GPAs, and we did see an increase in the number of credit hours that they took from semester to semester, and we saw them drop out um, at a lower rate than those students that didn't have a DART Pass. So that kind of let, let us know we were moving in the right direction with regards to addressing this particular um, student um, uh, barrier. And it also gave us um, a good um, baseline for our own, for our technology staff, for our um, uh, procurement staff about how to deal with a vendor um, in, in a non-traditional environment where we're not just buying something from a vendor, we're actually doing systems development with the vendor. I'm actually getting our institutional research um, department, um, giving them access to other data sharing um, agreements that we didn't have in the past that can make us much more informed when we go to make a decision about which programs to offer where. We had this wealth of information of seeing where our students are willing to travel and where they're not. And it also enhanced um, the number of times uh, DART increased the frequency of buses that would go to our campuses. So because we had increased ridership, we started to become a priority for DART to become a, an increased uh, frequently stop. So um, again, it, this was this was very self-serving. If the students just took advantage of the regular stops, that was great. But now we're getting even additional stops being added to our campuses because guess what? The ridership is demanding it. So um, made me feel good. It's like oh wow, we had a good idea, and over six to nine months we acted on it, and things. Things work, so you get you get brave. You get um, you became less risk averse. The next one was um, food security, and you know when 25 to 30 percent of your student population, um, based on our sample surveys and and um, and working with them, that at any one time in a in a calendar year, they were they were expressing severe food security. You know um, some people to the point where um, you know, not knowing where your next meal can come from, but not even knowing how to approach an agency to get that next meal. And then the, the students that are, you know, depending on other students um, to provide them with food. And it, it's really, um, it's, 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 it's not only just food, but it's good food, you know. So there's, there's a ton of food around that's processed and inexpensive, but not really healthy. And that seemed to be also um, what our students were, were complaining about too, you know, that, that, that the access that they had to was typically fast food. There were, amazingly enough, a lot of our students in, this, uh, in the 30% in that were expressing food insecurity, they did not have access to a grocery store. And, you know, for us that are, you know, so used to being able to drive to the local grocery store, um, you know, 
they're, they're, they were they were left um, with only access at convenience stores or mini marts where the food prices are extremely high and the fresh produce is really not not available. So it's not only the lack of access to food, um, even if they had access to some places, it was the affordability of the food that was there. And then there was we have a large population of, um, of undocumented uh, citizens that um, even those food stamps and other programs are available to them. They don't take the they don't avail themselves of it because they don't want to be um, known to the government. You know, they're really reluctant to give anybody their information. So we took the solution because we had really no we had no ability to provide any uh, inroad into this um, into the solution ourselves because we just didn't have the capacity to buy food and give that out. Um, however, we, we partnered, we established a partnership with the North Texas Food Bank. And by having hard and fast data about the students that were expressing food insecurity and their location, not only their location of where they lived, but also the location of where they were going to school and where they worked, because we had that information too, we could establish patterns of where maybe the next best place for a food truck could show up. And we, um, and our, and we initial, we, we, we scheduled, we said, well, at a minimum, we want to like, we want to hopefully convince you North Texas food bank to show up at our campuses once a month with your food truck. We know that's not enough, but that's, you know, we have to start somewhere. And they, they rather quickly agreed because we had the hard data to show them here's the population, um, some of which they already were aware of through other uh, data sharing agreements that they had. But we, you know, we were saying these are the students that are, that are ambitiously trying to get out of, of, of poverty through education. And um, we wanted to have the, the trucks. And the trucks were, um, you know, they would rather quickly empty uh, whenever they visited our campuses within an hour or two. Um, an entire truck would 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 be um, emptied of the of what they were bringing, and in some cases they would bring the next time the instead of the truck you see here in the on the picture they would bring a semi trailer, and um, and sometimes it would be themes. So sometimes the themes would be canned. Sometimes like I think the picture you see there, the theme was peanut butter. Um, you know some of the things that were healthy but non perishable, and you could um, rather quickly uh, disseminate them. Um, that was a uh, rather um, uh, telling. Now, what we didn't know, this is the side pieces, our faculty and staff, when they heard about this finding and when they saw the trucks and they saw our students and they heard these stories, they rather quickly started donating their, um, some of their time and money. And they said, well, this needs to happen on our campus. Um, we need to establish a food pantry on all of our major campus locations and we'll fund it out of our own pockets um, and uh, we'll buy whatever we can buy. And within a year, all of our campuses had um, uh, food pantries. All of them had, uh, we had relationship with North Texas Food Bank, and then we just dealt, uh, developed relationships with the local grocery stores that would um, sometimes throw out produce that would pass their date, but it would still be good for another week or so. And um, we became, um, and, and our agreement with North Texas Food Bank was we couldn't just segregate our students uh, into this pantry that any we would have to also allow any citizen locally to be able to drive on the campus which were a public campus they could visit the food bank too until all our resources were um, exhausted so again um, really no operational funds from the from our college uh, our uh, foundation uh, some of the foundation um, you know the the regular providers of funds to our foundation. They this is now their pet project, and they're and they're out in the in the um, in the neighborhood raising money for our food banks. And again, the side uh, scrape of this is the data that we're collecting um, is you know it's it's gold to uh, to the North Texas Food Bank. Um, you know they we'll keep a little bit more data on our students than they keep on their typical food bank uh, visitors. And, um, you know, we're, we're actually seeing, you know, again, recovery patterns of our students through the access to, to food that um, maybe not as deep and definable as that recovery impact through transportation shows us, but we know it's working. And, um, and what we also discovered was there's actually a, an undercurrent of some of our staff, the entry level staff, that were also taking advantage of the food bank because 
Um, they may have not been making poverty wage, but their families were get growing or they were they had multi-families in their house. So, um, you know, this was also uh, uh, a resource for some of our staff. So two down and we're, and we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. And uh, so we visited the next variable on the list and um, really became intimidated rather fast because health services, um, it's not a surprise. Um, you know, these are both um, physical health services and mental health services. And, um, you know, these are increasing on all our campuses, um, uh, you know, particularly in the pandemic. And this is really an area where we had no capacity to provide any sort of service because we just don't, we're not a provider of health services. But we saw within the data the same issues that we saw with transportation and, um, you know, food, that it, it was always a, a, you know, a question of access and affordability. And, um, you know, the good thing about this is it's such a high um, critical event for uh, the rest of the country, you know, um, starting with, you know, lower cost to uh, health care uh, programs that started with Obamacare. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of agencies out there that are, um, you know, trying to solve this issue. So, you know, it was up to us to find out which ones should we cultivate a relationship with. And early on, um, because we were close to Austin, there was this, this website that one of our uh, faculty showed us. It was called Aunt Bertha, and it was basically uh, created by a gentleman whose who's Aunt Bertha um, was uh, uh, falling into ill health, did not have a, a lot of money, and she was at a distance from um, where the gentleman lived. He, so he couldn't go help her, um, but, you know, that was his favorite aunt, and it was, you know, he was feeling so bad that he couldn't, you know, you know, leave, drive five hours, and spend some time with her to get her to the to the to the right um, healthcare areas. That he created a website and a company around the website, a nonprofit called Ampertha, and basically he vetted. Um, you know, it started small. You know, thousands of of providers of services, everything from hospitals, clinics, to social service agencies to um, charities, and he created a website that basically provided all this information sorted by zip code, and it grew from the Austin, Texas area, to Texas, to the United States, and by the time we um, were aware of it, um, he had 30 or 40,000 resources in his database, and now it's probably easily well into the six figures, and it was a single place for an anonymous search to occur. You didn't have to give up any of your information, and based on keyword searches that they've made very easy to understand, um, across the top here, um, you can see it's food, housing, um, you know, uh, transit, legal aid. You could search in your um, zip code and be given a vetted list of uh, service providers, um, how to contact them, what the uh, information you'll need to um, use to contact them, and um, how to get directions, how to, you know, and it was connecting all the dots. And, you know, I kind of liken this back to when I was in college and I would go visit the, you know, the, the healthcare, you know, either the nurse or the health services office on campus. And I'd walk in and they would give me a brochure or five brochures and say, you know, here's places you can go in the neighborhood. And, but, you know, that if it was on a brochure, I, you know, nine times out of 10, I wouldn't go visit. This provides that same type of activity, but in, in a much higher volume. Um, we, we could have used this and, and, and provided it to our students for free because it, it's a free service on the internet. And you can use it now. I think it's called findhelp.org. He's evolved. Um, and it doesn't cost anybody anything. It's been, it's nonprofit funded. Um, it's, you know, he's gotten federal grants to, to keep this resource growing. And, um, but the, by doing so, we would not have any access to the data. So we pay, um, uh, the college from Dallas College pays to be able to see not only our students or the, the students of Dallas College in, you know, how they anonymously move through the system because it's a co-branded website. And if, if they, the student came to it on the Dallas College website, their activity would be um, tracked, but not their names. Um, and then we would compare again that information with the, the local surrounding information. 
And um, again, it, we showed that our students had a different set of priorities than some of the uh, citizens, where the citizens were really, um, the local citizenry was really concerned about housing. Our students were concerned about health, health services. So they either had a place to stay, um, but their next piece of the, of the pie was their health services. Um, after about a year of watching our students use this, um, we had heard of, of, about through um, Amp Earth uh, of a company called Pieces Tech, and they had a federal grant to work within uh, the Dallas area to not only provide these types of um, anonymous services, but also to share patient information, um, you know, on the behalf of the patient with over 350 service providers. So, um, and we were we would we were the first higher education service provider where a student could say, I need this help so bad, I'm willing to give you um, my permission to allow me to, you know, engage um, a hospital or a clinic or a, a social service agency in, in my name. And then um, because, you know, I'm either at risk or I need housing today or I need to, you know, so the, the need is a little bit higher. So the information it has to become much more secure. We had to um, make sure that our information was scrubbable for HIPAA because some of these were uh, medical records. But it rather quickly provided students access to hundreds of providers that they may not be either be aware of, cognizant of, know the cost. And again, um, the data integration piece allowed us to, to really um, see how our students and our citizens were um, taking advantage of this. Now, again, uh, when we go and plummet, we can't see which of our students are taking advantage of it from a name perspective, but we can see all the summary information. And it's, um, it's, it's rather, um, again, intimidating when COVID hit, the, the, the spike in the use of the um, mental health services was significant. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was easily, you know, you know, you're not sitting there waiting for it to happen, but you're not surprised by that activity. So um, the health services, again, um, since a lot of it is information we cannot tie directly back to an individual student, it's kind of hard to measure the success. But the students that take advantage of it, um, they let you know rather quickly um, how well it's working for them. And we've the pieces tech, it was new. And since, again, it's... Um, highly interactive with the student. There's probably just a few hundred students that are taking advantage of it at any one time. They'll go in, get their services, and come back out. Um, the the Amp Bertha, the findhelp.org, again, it follows the academic calendar, the utilization of that software. Um, we have found out through the utilization that um, there were certain members of our staff that were using it really heavy. And we when we, when we drove down into the data, uh, we saw that through IP traffic, those were coming from our um, advising offices. So our advisors fell in love with this tool, and they would log in anonymously and show a student, hey, look what you can do. Here's the places you can go, and then turn them on to the student who would then, you know, navigate the, the website themselves. Mobile ready, um, very easy interface that asks you for your um, zip code that you want to search in and then gives you uh, a number of uh, options to present the information to you in. And then if you want, you can create an anonymous account that'll save all of your searches and um, you basically uh, get into it using a pin. So uh, again, hard to tie back a, a direct relationship, but it was um, rather uh, telling how we were able to um, you know, receive a lot of quantitative feedback. Um, access to programs. Uh, it's amazing how many people um, don't realize that if you're uh, uh, within a certain poverty level, you can pretty much get a free education uh, funded through Pell. And we turned that around as a, uh, an opportunity to market to um, uh, our high school seniors in Dallas County. Um, uh, we, we, we targeted the, the schools with the highest number of percentage of students and families below poverty. I think our first group of uh, uh, schools was 23 schools. The next year we increased it to 47. Now I think there are over 53 schools and we just keep going up. And um, the approach is to get them uh, into Pell, 
Um, and any other money that they need to finish, our foundation has set aside um, some money uh, uh, to, to do the last dollar scholarships. And we've also, you know, because of the Promise program, we're attracting national attention and we're getting um, some federal funds to uh, continue the project. Um, and, it, and it basically, we're using the technology side of it, we're using uh, Salesforce to track what we consider the, con the non-consumers of education. We try to turn them into consumers. What better uh, platform to use than Salesforce? And again, and it's, it's primarily around the message of we'll walk into a high school, ask all the seniors to come to the auditorium, and then we say, if you pledge to uh, 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 that you want to go to college, we'll make sure that happens with you. And not just our college. We, um, we worked with the University of North Texas. SMU is contributing scholarships. Um, uh, there's a, a number of other in institutions that, you know, once they realize that, hey, yeah, we've already been doing this for years, but we never called it this, that um, it was important to repackage that that group of financial aid around uh, something that resonates with the student population because it's it's very easy to describe as I promise to give you a free college education. If you attack, if you say, hey, look, you know, if you fill out the FAFSA and you do this and you, and you go get your immunizations and you do that, that's lost on too many students, that potential students, and that be, you know, but if you say, I promise, and you pledge, we'll lead you through those steps. We'll get you through um, those federal financial aid barriers. And oh, by the way, now the state of Texas, because of our um, experience in this program, are they're going to require every graduating senior to fill out the, the FAFSA form, the federal financial aid form. And um, so, you know, that that's a testament to the success of the students. We've had 20 some thousand students now roll through this over numbers of years. We've had some really interesting uh, activity in our dual enrollment. And we uh, the last point there is we um, we're, we're talking to fifth graders as a college to say this is something you can look forward to, because guess what? By the eighth grade, you can take a college class. So um, it's not we're not waiting for college seniors anymore. We're getting them into dual enrollment. Our dual enrollment number spiked. Um, uh, uh, 800 students graduating with a, an associate's degree prior to graduating with a, with a high school um, uh, degree, so a high school diploma. So um, this was a tech-heavy environment because we took advantage of messaging systems and Salesforce. Um, but again, what it, what it brought us is a, a pool of data that we realized that a lot of these students, um, it's, a, it's a cultural barrier that um, is familiar I and mean, it comes from their family, it comes from their culture, that college is not an option. And so we um, we decided to push through that barrier too. And there's also now a parent promise. And if any college senior takes, uh, here's the message, um, we bring their parents in the room and say, guess what, you can, you too can have um, a free education. And I think that that number's in the hundreds of the parents that are, are taking advantage of this. And some really neat stories, if you ever wanna look on the internet, Dallas College Promise or Dallas County Promise, there's a mother and daughter team that you know, if, if this was the only group that it affected, these, this mother and daughter, um, well worth any, any, any time and materials that we spent on it. Access to programs, I mean, access to um, materials. Um, we realized that because of the cost, only 40% of our students purchased course materials or could even afford access to their academic records after they, they left transcripts again access and affordability this this all comes down to the the, the two main drivers um, the first solution we did with regards to course materials is we looked at all the money we were spending our students were spending with Follette our bookstore um, companion and when they told us how much money it was um, and we were only serving 40 percent of the camp of the, of the students we told them that we would guarantee them that much if we could serve every student and um, it was an interesting discussion, took 18 months to negotiate, but we took on the board, the burden. Um, how we did it uh, was we added $20 per credit hour to our, our tuition, which was already low. It's still below the average in the state of Texas. So it went from 59 to 79 because we knew at that point we could still deliver Pell and all of this would be um, covered uh, within those dollars. The, the, the tuition cost now covers any course material, and it's delivered to the student prior to the first day of class, whether it's digital or print. Um, 
we say deliver now because back when we started, it was pre-COVID, they could come to the bookstore and pick up the books that they were ordering, but now they're being shipped. And Fallout really stepped up because we didn't have the money to ship them, but they were so proud of the project and their participation in it. And um, we didn't want to have to negotiate with over 300 publishers that we were taking, you know, that we were using, that our faculty had selected. So um, we allowed Follette to, to, to be our distribution partner, let them deal with the publishers. Um, and uh, the data integration took a, a hefty amount of work to make sure our systems were tied, our, our enrollment systems were tied to Follette's uh, point of sale system so that we could um, carry this out. But again, um, that was minuscule now that we're two semesters away and um, every one of our students in the fall and every one of our students in the spring, I keep saying our, but I'm not in Dallas anymore, so sorry. But every one of the students had all the course materials delivered prior to um, beginning. And again, we're watching. And again, the, the, the performance statistics are inching up, uh, definitely inching up in, in the GPAs, because now a student has access to all their course materials. Um, the one that I have here uh, at Indian River, and I've only been here a month, but we've already, um, we just signed yesterday, or we just got approved yesterday by our board to become an Adobe Creative Campus. And um, this is, we're the first community college, I think, other than Austin, but they're only offering it for a, a couple of their programs. We're offering uh, and providing for our students um, the full Adobe suite. And so every student, every faculty member, every staff member will get all the, the products of the Adobe suite for free and because um, we want to help our students establish their brand. Um, back in the day, 15 years ago, you know, the big thing was uh, Microsoft Office. Our students need to have it because when they move into business or if they want to get a job, they need to know Microsoft Office. So we created curriculum around Microsoft Office and we, we gave it to them for $10 a, a year. And that's what we're doing with Adobe because these are the tools of the next generation, Photoshop, Premiere, um, all, the, all the manipulation tools, all the... The storage tools, they'll get 100 gigabytes of free storage to, you, to use. And um, I'm excited because, again, I'm in an area where there's, there's no way a student could afford this, even at the student uh, rate of $20 a month. So um, it, it's going to inflame the campus. And then the one that probably got me the most uh, press, which was access to student transcripts. Um, a couple of years ago, ITTC Tech failed. Uh, their students inundated our campuses at the request of the Department of Education. We realized that those students could not have access to their transcripts. And so guess what? We were telling students that had two, three um, classes away from their degree and certificate programs. They had to start over because we had no valid transcript. Uh, my chancellor turned around, looked at me and said, um, if we get hit by a tornado, if we have a fire in our data center, where are our students going to go to get their transcripts? And I tell you that talk about a challenge. Um, but you know, Bitcoin was around. I was reading books about it. Um, the blockchain platform seemed a perfect. If we could get them a vetted transcript from our systems um, on demand, and then also have a history of it, um, the student could get it from the blockchain whenever. So uh, talk about the registrars not being my best friend anymore because they wanted that student to come to us and pay $5 or $10 and it was a revenue producer. And I'm going, but it's you're focused on the organization, not the student. Um, and if you're in the community college space or even some of the public institutions, your students may attend five or six institutions before they're done. It's not the way it was when, when I was a student when you know, I went to one or two different colleges, and then so it was really easy to get transcripts. Um, the blockchain platform um, provided by Greenlight Credentials is, is an amazing platform for any sort of student record storage. And we've turned, um, you know, Dallas College was the first one to do this in the nation, while uh, MIT, Stanford, University of Texas at Austin, we're still talking about it. I used to listen to their, their speeches, and I thought, man, they had great ideas, and then I went, and we would go implement them, and three years later, we were the only one on the market. We've got over 1.8 million student records in the cloud, in the in the blockchain, and um, the local ISD is now throwing their student records into the blockchain. And the state of Texas, again, looked at us, liked it, and they're now partnering with the academic um, with Greenlight Credentials to put all of the state of Texas's K through 12 student records up in the chain. So um, there are technology solutions out there waiting for us to find, 
There are partnerships. Greenlight Credentials, we couldn't have done it without them, and they couldn't have done it without us because we were their first customer, and um, we co-developed it with them because there was nobody else doing this. So that's my um, – That's I'm, I'm at 16 seconds left, so I always come in right under. I just want to – um, you know, I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm looking forward to you giving me the opportunity to, to question you when we have a conversation because I want to know what you're doing. Um, I'm ignorant. I'm always looking to, to add uh, new things to my uh, uh, my uh, quiver. So thank you. Carlos? So Carlos, I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Is that better? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, one, once again, uh, thank you, the team, for for all this information that you compress in 50 minutes uh, uh, of of talk, and of course, more more details, uh, uh, you know, are are uh, behind scenes, if you will. But um, you, um, Yelixa, if we if we have questions from the audience, uh, you know, team wants to to do that. Team, do you want to do you want to lead that uh, that aspect of of you said questions from the team from the audience? Yeah, I think um, Yabelkis let me know that you you would be able to see the the chat and you could ask them, or if you want me to go in the chat, I don't know if they're. Uh, we can we can read the chat for you, or if you prefer, we can open the microphones so they can also talk to you. Whatever is your wish. Do you have Do you, you have a few minutes, uh, Tim, for the microphone to be open? Yeah, all the all the time you need to take. Okay. okay. All right. Let's, let's okay, right now. Yeah, the mics are open, so if there's anyone who wants to address your questions, this is the time to do so. Go ahead. We can also read on the chat if you don't want to talk. Yeah, this is Yuelki. I'm driving, but I'm listening. And, and it's amazing, team. I'm impressed of all the great work you have done. On behalf, I used to be a student, a graduate student, and, and I identify with all this struggling, although in our, in my side, it wasn't that bad, but uh, we identify with all these issues, and wow, I'm moved, I'm impressed, I'm, I just want to congratulate you. And uh, please, uh, uh, Duque is, uh, it's open for questions because definitely this information has been coming to you. So thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. As, as, we get, as we get another question lined up, uh, team, I want to ask you, uh, if you can expand a little bit more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, through, through all these initiatives that you have led, uh, certainly there has been a, what I will call an unintended consequence uh, on the positive side of things, right? Uh, yeah. uh, and, and you pointed to one, which again is uh, one of those, uh, which is the, uh, on the aspect of the, of the uh, DART pass, uh, I think you mentioned that their GPA and the retention increase. Can you expand a little bit on, on the effect that initiative had on student retention? Yeah, so the, um, the DART pass it was very easy to watch you know, because we knew which students were taking advantage of the DART pass. We actually had a before and after, and we could see, you know, we did, you know, we did their grades before, we did their grades after, and there were, you know, there were, it was less than a, you know, a point, probably in some cases, a 0.3 to 0.5% um, of, of an increase in the GPA. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gone. The retention numbers are harder only because some of them uh, students, the way the traditional um, colleges and universities um, measure retention, and I'm sure you're aware of this, particularly in Texas, that if they start with you in a declared program, and they don't finish with you, you failed. And what we were yeah. finding out as we were moving through some of the quantitative and the qualitative discussions with our students were they never intended to finish with us. So um, for whatever reason, whether it was because they were moving or they were already engaged at another institution, they would come and take, uh, they would have to declare a major because we made them declare a major. And then they would take two or three courses and then move on. So um, we had a lot of heated discussions about um, mm -hmm. 
retention, that which we still have to report back to the coordinating board and you know the oversight board in Texas, but less and less of that is becoming um, a discussion point because we're finding out that um, when we talk to UT Austin, for example, where a, a number of our students went, UT Austin was having issues with retention because their students would drop out in the summertime, go to a community college, and then come back. And then sometimes they would go um, and, and finish you know, the last 25% of their degree closer to home. And so the retention numbers are like, okay, the student was successful upon their own measuring stick, but the institution wasn't because we're being asked to measure ourselves against a, a variable that may not be even worth looking at. But, you know, Dallas, our retention was so bad, you know, mm -hmm. our initial was so low that we couldn't, like, talk our way out of it. So I still think they have a ways to go with regards to how that uh -huh. applied towards the overall retention number because not every student took advantage of it. But we definitely knew those students that did, and we could plot their progress within the performance metrics of a class and a certificate. And when they re and when those students, when they did come back and enroll the next semester, they took more credit hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, wow. There is a there is a question um, from the audience in regards to is there any way of knowing the type of health services students requested the most? And the second part is did, did these health services provided long term prescription for students with specific medical conditions? Yeah, that's yeah. The, so the, the ones we do have uh, the ability to see the, um, you know, the AMP Bertha or the findhelp.org, we can see the, the location specific places they're looking. So, you know, um, in the beginning, a lot of it had to do with emergency centers, but we couldn't see what was occurring. We didn't even know if they went to the emergency center because, like I said, this was all anonymous. Um, those that are um, in the system that the second system I talked about, the pieces tech, those are medical records. And um, we could, again, see the, we could actually know for sure that they were being, they were actually visiting uh, an urgent care center or a doctor. But um, those, mech, those records, you know, we're not a medical institution. We had no right to go uh -huh. look and see what their conditions were. We had no right to go and ask them, you know, that's the stuff that's like you can't ask. But we did, you know, but because they used that pieces tech um, application, we knew that they were getting, that they, they were being engaged as um, uh, as a patient. Um, there was no guessing about it. They were, you know, they were going to either mental health. Now, an offshoot of that, a side offshoot of that was with UT Southwestern that does um, a lot of health services. They asked to perform a study using our student population and um, we got a lot of, it was all about mental health. And we got a lot of information mm -hmm. back about the types of mental health solutions that they were looking for, whether it was, um, it could have been depression, it could have been suicide prevention. We got some really hard and fast numbers, but not by student. We just knew that this was summary. The second one mm -hmm. was, um, you know, the, the prescriptions. Um, you know, that, that that's a that's a deep dive in, in this country's um, uh you know, I call it not a healthcare plan. It's a lack of healthcare. You know, people say uh -huh. this is you know healthcare. This is lack of healthcare. Um, there, that's a that's a challenge that um, be, you know, it's based on sometimes your location, the service provider. There's so many variables in um, how you can gain access to um, you know specific applications. That you know, I can you know we can talk about insulin and and you know the the whole uproar about insulin where people's costs went from you know, thirty or forty dollars a prescription to six hundred dollars a prescription. Um, it, it's 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 actually sometimes you know medicine specific how or whether you can get um, a decent mm -hmm. um, uh, you know and you know I I was in the hospital last year and there was a medication that I am taking regularly and the hospital didn't have it and you know yeah. and so the hospital said well we can go to the pharmacy next door and get it and it's going to cost you about eight hundred dollars I went. Holy crap! I've never paid. I've never paid more than forty dollars for this. I called my wife mm -hmm. and said, "Come to the hospital. <laughs> as much as you don't want to see me right now, <laughs> bring my bring my medicine because." And, and 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 so you've got all of these different variables weighing upon 
how and when you can get medicine and how much it costs depends on those variables that it's really hard. That's a great question, but it's one we, you know, we talked a hundred times about trying to influence a hospital, you know, for a specific cohort and they, they, they may not even be ready to serve that cohort. All right. There is a, there is a question here. Uh, and I think your, your contact info is up on the screen, but uh, what's your position at India River State College? Can you can you restate that? I think that they are trying to follow up or maybe lure you to Puerto Rico, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I love San Jose, so yeah, talk to me. Um, uh, my my position is Vice President of Institutional Technology and Chief Information Officer. Um, I like to change the, my title because I think the traditional I.O. It's it, it there's, a, there's an evolution needed. Mm -hmm. So I guess my uh my you know my I'm, my own infrastructure is giving me issues, so I don't have a video anymore. Oh, okay. But can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Something something happened. Um. Well. Um. In the interest of time, a uh, team. I want to to thank you again for for your availability for your willingness to share some of those uh, activities and 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 high stake projects that you have led a, 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 through the use of technology in a way that help us uh, break down or remove student barriers this this has been very very informative for, for me of course every time i learn something something new and also for a, a, our audience you see in the chat it has been pretty active and, and the group has been uh, very engaged. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you everybody for uh, your attendance this afternoon. Uh, and we, we look forward to seeing you uh, the next time. And again, team, thank you and it's good to see you. Yes, thank you, team. Thank you, team. Thank you so much. It was have been wonderful. I'm so happy that we recorded this so we can share with the others that couldn't connect so thank you so much and remember that tomorrow we have a webinar at 3 p.m in spanish so we hope that you can join us too thank you carlos for your time and Elisa, right. thank you for, for for the backup have a good day bye bye take care bye bye thank you thank you appreciate it bye bye